This lecture is being brought to you in part by the generous gifts of these sponsors. Yes, thank you, Laurie, and good evening, Ocala. It's wonderful to be with you and be with all these friends of IHMC. It's really my pleasure to be able to, to share with you a journey that I've personally been on over these past 12 or so years that really leads to the title of the quantified human. I'll start my lecture this evening with giving you some of the background, some of the context as to why I became passionate about this particular area. It really rose out, if you will, a, a burning platform that the Air Force was dealing with over a decade ago. But I'll cover some of that context and st set the stage for now how this translates over all these years later into two large research projects that IHMC is leading. The first one is called STAC, and everything with the Defense Department has an acronym, so I'll spell out the acronyms, what STAC stands for. And then we have a second one called APEX that hopefully will bring to life what we mean when we use this terminology of the quantified human. So Laurie just gave you some of my background, but it'll set the stage in terms of 29 years with the Defense Department doing research and development for the DOD. Most of it, as you can see, the AFRL that Laurie referenced is the Air Force Research Laboratory. It consists of 12 locations around the world that does uh, all the fundamental and applied research for our airmen. As Laurie mentioned, I was a DARPA program manager. If you're not familiar with DARPA, this is the agency that has brought you the internet, stealth, GPS, and all the other amenities that we now associate with modern life. I was a senior scientist for biotechnology and human performance. I switched over into that area from material science, and I became the first chief scientist of the human performance wing. And that's relevant here because you'll see some of the key factors that the human performance wing got pulled into in solving some of these critical Air Force problems. And then I was the chief technology officer for the last four years of my career with AFRL. The bottom line, uh, my entire career has been at this interface of biological and human sciences, which then really led to my passion. And my passion has been, how do we begin to demystify the role of the human in a complex system? It no longer has to be a black box when we think about an overall system performance. And in many ways, that's how it'd been treated within the Defense Department. And in many ways, it still is treated that way. But I think that's changing. The publication that you see on the side there that's now over 10 years old called The Quantified Warrior started to lay out this concept that we can do more with how we approach the human sciences. And that more gets into how do we begin to think about the human as a part of the system that can now be quantified and actually be part of the overall systems engineering perspective. And again, I'll, I'll talk about that here for the rest of the talk. So what was the burning platform? Around the 2011-2012 uh, time frame, our fifth generation fighters, and when I say fifth generation, I'm talking about the F-22 and the F-35, they were having these things called UPEs, unexplained physiological episodes. And so what was happening is that our pilots in these aircraft were having a difficult time breathing and getting oxygen. And so a little background about these platforms. These platforms generate oxygen on the actual airframe. They generate the oxygen using something that's called an OBOGS, an onboard oxygen generating system. And so what we were trying to deal with is figure out why aren't the pilots getting enough oxygen. And of course, we lost aircraft because of this. As you might imagine, it's a catastrophic event when the pilot can no longer get the appropriate oxygen. And this has been a, something that's been studied in the Air Force for many years. But the central question was really the, the paradigm that set me on this journey is that that platform that you see there takes thousands of measurements across the entire airframe every second. And those measurements are used to actually keep that airplane in the air. All of our fifth generation and stealth fighter aircraft are flight unstable. And the reason that they can maintain flight is because of the active control system that comes through the onboard processing of sensor data from that platform. So if I'm taking these thousands of measurements across that aircraft every second, why am I not taking a single measurement off the pilot that's in the cockpit? I would think of all the things that I'm going to measure or instrument, that would strike me as a pretty important one to make sure that we get right. But yet at that time, we weren't. 
And when we started scrambling to try and figure out what was causing these unexplained physiological events, we were literally taking clinical grade uh, pulse oximeters out of a hospital setting and using hospital tape to tape them to pilots' fingers. Well, this may not shock you, but pilots use their hands a lot in the cockpit, so you can imagine how that went over in terms of when they're trying to use their controls and their joystick. So we had to come up with a better way, and that's the underlying motivation. But this isn't a lesson that we somehow learned in 2011 or 2012. This goes all the way back to World War II, and this is before the Air Force was a separate force and was the Army Air Corps. There was a lieutenant colonel there by the name of Paul Fitz, now, Paul Fitz was studying a problem in World War II because of the unprecedented rate of aircraft production during that time period. Pilots were confusing the flaps with the landing gear. Again, that's a pretty big problem if you're getting those two mixed up. So, Lieutenant Colonel Fitz started going about a systematic scientific review to figure out how do you actually lay out a cockpit so those type of confusions don't take place. And so, as the pioneering work of Paul Fitz in World War II, would actually, he went on to, after the war, to academic careers at Ohio State and Michigan and actually founded the field of human factors engineering that dominates how we think about the design of the human in the system today. So let's talk about control loops. This gentleman here, Colonel John Boyd, is a legend in the Air Force when it comes to thinking about control loops. In Korea, he flew the F-86 Sabre, and when Korea wound down, he went to the Pentagon, and he was actually pioneered this concept of energy maneuverability theory, EM theory. So that aircraft that you just saw in the previous slide, one of its, if you will, uh, secret capabilities, but it's not secret, I wouldn't say it in this form, is the fact that it operates at extremely high altitudes. The higher the altitude, the higher the energy that you have, and you can defeat your adversary the higher you go. He was the pioneer of that type of thinking and how to revolutionize dogfighting. The other thing that he pioneered is that OODA loop over there. The, again, another DOD acronym, observe, orient, decide, and act, a decision loop. His treatise at that time, which has proven to be correct ever since his pioneering work in the 60s, is the fact that if I'm a pilot and I can do that quicker than my adversary, I'm going to win. And by when, that means I'm going to survive and my adversary is not. And that OODA loop, again, has dominated our thinking of aerial combat ever since. So we started thinking and asking ourselves, what would be an instantiation of Colonel Boyd's OODA loop as we were to think about applying that to the human sciences and the human in a weapon system? And so that's where we came up with this human-centric control loop that we first laid out in that publication I showed about how do we do in a sense assess augment cycle and do that quick enough so that it makes a difference in the performance in the cockpit. Now there are a couple seminal things, so I mentioned this critical time period around 2011 and 2012. There were some other things that were occurring in the world other than those UPEs with our fifth gen fighters that were incredibly influential and I, I look back at it now almost 12 years later about how influential it was. The first is a physician out of Stanford by the name of Eric Topol published a book called The Creative Destruction of Medicine. It's one of the best books. It was, again, hard to believe it was published in 2011, all this time later. A fantastic look at the coming age of personalized medicine and what that would mean. And one of the things that Dr. Topol highlighted in that book was the fact, looking forward into the evolution of where wearables would go and wearable technology, that this truly was going to have a profound impact on medicine but in addition, a variety of other factors that were happening concurrently. These are well-known megatrends that have been identified. There are things like the ex exponential decrease in the cost of sequencing the human genome, the, uh, the incredible revolutions that we're seeing in neuroscience and biotechnology. All these things were highlighted. So this unprecedented insight and this, this coming call that individualization was coming was something that really influenced our thinking about this loop. So back to what I mentioned in my opening, no longer did human science have to rely upon a normal distribution, because up to this point, this is how we engineered how the human was going to function within a weapon system or within a cockpit. We would take normal distributions and fit to the mean. 
we didn't have to do that any longer. And again, this role of individualization is changing defense science, but it's also changing the science around us writ large. But it's important to point out that we never thought about census S augment as a standalone system. Instead, we thought about how can we take this paradigm and actually start to incorporate it into the machine-centric control loops that I mentioned to you earlier, actually keep these airplanes in the air. And now, all of a sudden, if I can take the human component and make it part of the overall systems engineering of the system, then I can start to ask very interesting technical questions about what is the interdependence between the system and the human? What's the appropriate time constant of sharing information between the platform and the human that I should begin to implement? So that's enough of the stage setting and giving the context. And now hopefully I'll bring it to life by showing how we're implementing it in those two large research programs that I mentioned in the beginning. So first I told you what STACK would stand for. The mouthful is Strategies to Augment Ketosis for Mild Traumatic Brain Injury. Now you know why we call it STACK. And I'll explain a little bit about what you're looking at there. The experimental paradigm for this has been at Basic Airborne School at Fort Benning, Georgia, now Fort Moore, Georgia. What you're looking at there is a tower, and let me explain a little bit about basic airborne training. It's composed of three weeks of training. The first week is on the ground where they're learning the actual technique to do a parachute landing fall. The second week is on a tower like that where they're actually in harnesses and being released and they now practice their falls coming out of the harness. And then the third week is the actual airborne jump week where they need to successfully complete five jumps with at least one of those jumps being at night. And so what I'm going to walk you through now is what this actually looks like in practice. The other key thing that I'd like to, to uh, be mindful of, and I think it's something that I certainly take great pride of in terms of the work that IHMC does, is the fact that when we do our work, we just don't do it in a place like Ocala or a place like Pensacola. We actually go out into the field and go to the bases where the subjects who can benefit the most from our research are actually part of the research. IHMC is very unique in being able to deploy large research teams to settings like Fort Moore to do the experimentation that I'm going to show you here in a minute. So to help bring this to life, because I imagine a lot of you haven't been through Basic Airborne, I have a little video clip to walk you through what it's like. And as we go through this, it'll give you a sense for one, the experimental paradigm. But you'll see here in the beginning, you'll see some examples of good falls, and then you'll see some examples of not so good falls that happen as they're learning their, their craft here on the tower. So this is another tower that they use during tower week. In this tower here, this is just practicing their egress and there's no release from the harness. This is now a closer up view of the tower that I just showed you in that picture. And the first part of nomenclature, the individual in the black hat there, they're creatively called black hats. And those are the, those are the instructors that actually watch the students and then pull that lever that releases them. And that was an example of a good landing. And also, truth be told, I think the instructors get a lot of joy out of dumping some of these students. So these students have to complete 20 successful jumps on the tower. And what they have to be able to demonstrate is that they can pull their body weight up on the risers. You'll see two straps in the front, two straps in the back. Those are the risers they have to pull up. This is our experimental team, and what that individual is doing is fitting that student with an impact sensor that goes under a skull cap right on the head. I'll show you a picture of this sensor in a minute. And then this is them taking a ketone ester, which is the test, that the test specimen, which were hypothesized to have a prophylactic effect. And I'll explain some of that science. Truth be told, it doesn't taste all that great. So his face was very appropriate, and that's why we always have uh, chasers of water and flavored water there for them as well. You also notice some of the bottles that they're taking are color-coded. We gave dosing commensurate with body weight, and we divided the subjects into three different body weight ranges here. Now, as you go through and watch some of these landings, I'll characterize 
as they land, they're being graded by those black hats. And so there's what they call a cadre scoring sheet. And so when you see an individual fall like that, you see the head whip back, that would be scored as a whiplash event. And then that's an example of a hard impact on the side. And so they will score that sheet. So when you see a whiplash event that's given a six, when they hit their head uh, hard on the ground, that's given an eight. And those numbers will be important here in a minute. You can see that we're uh, measuring the blood ketone level. So that's a ketone meter. And so what we actually want to study is how high did the levels get in their blood because they have to get to a certain level to have this protective effect if our hypothesis is correct. This is in one of the large classrooms that we used to draw blood. We did three different blood draws before they do their training, four hours after their training, and then the next morning so that there's significant time to look for biomarkers, and I'll explain that in a little bit as well. And then we give them tests. We give them two types of neurocognitive tests, and this is an example of a tablet that's measuring their balance. It's hypostulated that when you have a severe concussive event, it disrupts your vestibular system and that disrupts your balance. And this is a new product called Sway that we were testing to see if it could pick up on those balance differences. And then we also gave them a neurocognitive assessment before and after their training to see if there were differences caused by the impact in that assessment. And this is an example of just preparing the blood that we uh, drew. We did two different types of analyses. One part is looking for blood-borne biomarkers that are indicative of the impact. And this has been well studied in the literature that there are hallmark biomarkers that you can look at that are uh, indices of concussion. And then we're also uh, with a research partner out in Arizona called TGen, Translational Genomics. We're looking at the metabolic profile, the lipidomic profile, and some of the RNA sequencing from those blood samples that we take. Another neat thing that we do at IHMC is that we take these samples and we store them in minus 80 uh, freezers that we treat as a biorepository so that in the future we can go back and do additional analysis should it warrant that further look. Now, a little bit about the science and why we are giving this ketone ester supplement as a prophylactic. There are two different ways in which you can get ketone bodies. One is through diet, through a ketogenic diet. As you might appreciate with the young men and women that we're dealing with in this population, getting them on a ketogenic diet just isn't practical. So that's why one of the key breakthroughs, and this comes from work that was done at NIH, the National Institutes of Health, over 10 years ago, was a, uh, this ketone ester supplement that when you give it, it is broken down by the liver and it produces what are known as ketone bodies. There are two primary types of ketone bodies that we've studied in this work. One is beta-hydroxybutyrate, the top molecule. The other is acetoacetate. These are the two primary drivers of ketone bodies that are in the blood. And that's significant because of this wide range of systemic effects that these ketone bodies have been shown to have in the medical literature. Of relevance to a study that's looking at preventing the downstream effects of mild traumatic brain injury, it's the actual reduction of inflammation, the reduction of oxidative stress, and the increase in blood flow that's postulated to have the main mechanistic protective effects in how these, uh, how these chemicals are working in the blood. A little bit more about the science and where the hypothesis fits in. As you can probably gather from the movie and the, the protocol that I walked you through, we're not doing anything to alleviate the impact. We can't help that that's part of the training. But what we want to do is to target right here in those secondary injuries. If we can give a prophylactic that prevents the formation of those secondary injuries, is it going to have a beneficial effect in not only the immediate outcome, but long-term outcomes in terms of their future health? And again, you can see some of these systemic effects that I pointed out in a previous slide. So why do this field work at Fort Moore? The short and simple answer is throughput, and I call your attention to the second line here. 15,000 students go through Fort Moore every year to be qualified as basic airborne training qualified. 
One of the key things that we've already found out in this study is that in the literature, there's a wide range of incidence of MTBI between 10 and 25 percent. That range is so wide is because there wasn't a concise way, an accurate way, to actually measure whether somebody had a concussive event or not. What we're already seeing from the sensor implementation that we have put on these students, as well as some of the neurocognitive assessments, is that this range is actually between closer to 18 to 33 percent. So you do some quick math, 18 to 33 percent on 15,000 is thousands of kids that are receiving a mild traumatic brain injury by virtue of this training every year. So if we can make a difference in alleviating these secondary effects, it has a profound multiplication effect as well. When we originally designed the study, we wanted to enroll uh, equal then or less than 350 participants. The support that we got at Fort Moore was so outstanding with this actual study that we were able to recruit uh, actually closer to 390 students through this. So this is by far the largest study that's ever been conducted looking at a prophylactic in its treatment of mild traumatic brain injury. And now I'll talk a little bit about the unique aspects of this through that sense assess augment paradigm and what that looks like. So first the sense piece. This is that sensor I mentioned that was being put in the skull cap on the side of their head. It's about the size of a stick of chewing gum and it's about as thick as well. This is called the Lynx IAS system for uh, impact assessment sensor. This is made by a company called B3. B3 has been funded by the Defense Department for years to make blast sensors, and they make large uh, vest-worn blast sensors that our troops wear in theater today. But they also had a side project where they were developing a much smaller uh, impact sensor that would target a civilian market. So that's an example of the sense in the sense assess paradigm. The assessment piece, the neurocognitive piece that I was mentioning, there are examples of soldiers that are doing that sway test, again, that was looking at balance. And we also gave them an assessment both pre and post training called ANAM, another acronym, stands for Automated Neurocognitive Assessment Measures. And I'll show you some of the results of that because it's quite telling that when you do this type of neurocognitive assessment, we're testing different aspects of brain function. And I find it interesting how post-concussive event, how these different measures of cognitive performance change depending on the task at hand and depending on the severity of the impact. And also part of that assess piece is the biospecimen collection and analysis that you saw earlier. Three primary blood biomarkers that we're looking for, and this has been validated in the literature, and those are biomarkers called GFAP, UCHL1, and NFL for neurofilament light. And I also already mentioned the blood profiling that's going on with metabolomics, RNA sequencing, and lipidomics. And then the augment piece, which is the delivery of the prophylactic, and being within that window of efficacy. One of the nice things, and I'll talk towards the end about civilian translations, what in the Defense Department we call dual-use technology. You give the prophylactic, as you saw, if you can get over some of the taste. It takes 30 minutes to reach maximal levels within the blood. But then it has a window of efficacy between three and four hours before it gets cleared out of the blood again. So that's a nice window, because what else is three to four hours long? Football games? soccer matches. So that window correlates very nicely if you wanted to give a prophylactic uh, to a child, say, before they get into a sporting event. Well, I mentioned we recruited uh, close to 390 total participants. It was actually 329 that we got through the entire protocol, because as you go through a protocol, some people uh, drop out of the protocol, et cetera, don't adhere to the protocol. And the numbers here and getting into the bullseye, 232 of those individuals recorded at least one event using that impact sensor, but that was a very sensitive measure. If I were to constrict it all the way down, 58 of those 329, or 18 percent, 
scored at least one eight on that cadre scoring sheet. So if you remember the scoring, the black hats that are there watching them fall, if they get a whiplash event at six, if they hit their head with a significant impact, it gets an eight. So we're going to focus in on the eight that were scored by a hands-on instructor for having a significant head impact as they fell off that tower. And these are some of the preliminary results that we saw. I know there's a lot on here, so just give me a sense to a few minutes to walk you through uh, this busy slide. First, I'll call your attention to the key that's in the upper right. So the open circles means zero hit head impact is scored by the instructors. The closed circles means they had at least one eight score from the instructors. So that explains the open and the close. A little bit about the results. So I'll uh, focus your attention on this outside panel here and this outside panel here. These are measures of simple visual recognition and reaction time. So read into that, doesn't take a lot of cognitive processing. Just visually recognize something on the screen. If it's what the instructions say, press a button. That's it. Now what's interesting, if there's no impact, you actually see, if you look at the open circles, you see a negative slope. Why the negative slope? It's well known that there's a learning effect, a practice effect, from the first time you take it to the second time you take it. So that's why you see a decrease in that reaction time. For those that had a significant concussed event, you can actually, not only do you have a learning effect, you have quite the opposite. You have an increased reaction time and just being able to visually recognize something and press a button. For the middle two panels, it's even more interesting. It's more interesting because now we're not just doing a simple visual recognition task. What we are doing in the second panel here is that they have to remember a symbol that was paired with a number. So it's now involving a higher cognitive processing in terms of memory recall. And this panel over here, it involves mathematical processing. So now they have to start uh, accessing reasoning within the frontal cortex. And to give you an example of what that task looks like, they're given three single digit numbers, two operators like the example shown here, and they have to decide is it greater than five or less than five. If it's less than five, hit that button. If it's greater than five, hit that button. So again, you can see that the reasoning is much more involved here than just visually recognizing something. And this is where we start to see the largest effect between the group that's been concussed and the group that is not, with a significant increase in difference here in the reaction time or the processing time to actually get through that task. So this is the first time that we're starting to get very definitive evidence around being able to measure the impact of this concussive event during training and actually see it with quantified data. Now up to this point, I've used the term preliminary results, we still have the experimental groups blinded. So we can't tell which has got the placebo and which got the actual ketone ester until we finish our analysis to keep from introducing bias into the results. But I will foreshadow one of the things that we're very interested now in finding is we take this group of 58 that are lumped into here, understand how do those curves diverge if they got a placebo or they actually got the experimental treatment. I'm going to switch gears and now talk about the second project that I mentioned or foreshadowed in the beginning, this assessing and augmenting performance in extreme environments or just simply APEX. For the purposes of our discussion today, when we talk about extreme environments, the key thing that the Air Force is focused on this research effort has been examining fatigue, and in particular, the fatigue that's associated with long-distance transport. One of the key things that our military is concerned with now is how do we begin to prepare, hopefully never comes to it, but prepare for a near peer adversary like China. If we engage in that, that means you can't get over the tyranny of distance that's inherent in the Pacific. So if we're gonna start making uh, multi-dozen hour trips, uh, round trips through the Pacific, how do we begin to battle some of the inevitable fatigue that's gonna settle in? Should also mention that one of the unique things about this project is that this is a cooperative research project with the Air Force Research Laboratory. And what that means, if you normally get a research grant, it's just a one way, here's your grant, do your work. 
In this case, there's a back and forth between ourselves and our military sponsors that makes this very unique and very cooperative. The research group, this project is divided into a number of functional areas that map across the Sense Assess Augment framework that involve device integration, the assessment, and then I'll talk a little bit about the fatigue that we've, uh, the fatigue countermeasure that we've been studying. The other key thing that you'll see here in a minute is the fact that by virtue of this cooperative environment, it brings together commercial and academic partners to the table. And what's nice about that is that as we go through this research paradigm and study the appropriate uh, ameliorating effects here, we can bring in developmental technology that comes from our academic partners, but we can also bring in commercial technology that is COTS, commercial ready, that we can bring to the table. And that was very instrumental in a recent, re recent research exercise that we did at Camp Pendleton, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So going through the paradigm in a little more detail, on the sense side, triple ring technologies has brought to bear a very unique EKG, ECG sensor that also has an inertial measurement unit built into it, so you can get uh, body axis positioning information. Polar, who has done a tremendous amount, you may be familiar with Polar from the civilian fitness market, but they have done a tremendous work, amount of work with the DOD. And in this case, part of the, the Polar kit that they have brought to the table has been very instrumental, not just looking at heart rate, but one of the key measures of human performance that is emerging is looking at heart rate variability and measuring that accurately. Abbott Bio Wearables is part of this, and I'll talk a little bit about the interesting science that's coming out of measuring interstitial fluid. So if any of you use the Freestyle Libre system that's made by Abbott Bio Wearables for the diabetic market, it's an incredible technology that has really revolutionized how people treat diabetes. In this particular case, we're putting that sensor on healthy individuals because when you start to look at the interstitial fluid, it's an incredibly sensitive marker of stress, and you'll see some of the preliminary results from that. So uh, fascinating work that's emerging from that. And also continuing to look at pushing the envelope when it comes to flexible electronics. You know, it's one thing to make a sensor out of a printed circuit board, but we're bags of salt water, so putting rigid devices on us doesn't usually work all that well. So having things that can flex and move the way our skin does is really one of the key uh, research frontiers that we need to push. This is part of the assess piece in Sense Assess Augment. And as I mentioned before, we're looking at this aspect of fatigue. The key takeaway for as we lay out this protocol is that we're going to do a combination of both physical and cognitive fatigue in this actual protocol and go back and forth to make sure that we're actually uh, getting the maximal stress that we can that our institutional review board will allow. It's also interesting to note that when we talk about fatigue and, and experimentally inducing that in a lab environment, we're talking about doing this over 24 hours of fatigue-inducing study. And so again, it's very challenging from a human subject standpoint to be able to run participants through that kind of study. And then the augment piece, which I think is, is fascinating. We have been working with this company down here called Electricore for a number of years now. We have an ongoing project with Electricore that's looking at this aspect of transcutaneous vagal nerve stimulation and exploring both the arousal, wakefulness, and alert aspects of vagal nerve stimulation. So the project that we have ongoing with them now is joint with AFRL at the Defense Language Institute, where we take our soldiers, sailors, Marines, and airmen, and in a very intensive course, teach them a foreign language so that they can be useful as an analyst, say, studying things like Farsi. What we're doing is part of this experiment that when you, study, when you stimulate the vagal nerve, you actually see an increase in the acquisition of foreign language skills quicker than if they had not received this type of stimulation. And so what we are doing because of that we're asking ourselves, can I explore this transcutaneous uh, vagal nerve stimulation to actually reverse the effects of fatigue that are inherent in the protocol that I just shared with you? 
And the other key thing to point out, this is the actual uh, commercial device that they have now. As part of this program, again, back to the wearable aspect, they're building a flexible electrode that can be worn right over the neck, right where the vagal nerve comes down from the brain, and that's where the actual wearable electronic stimulation would occur. And so what did we see in our exercise? So this past fall, we just finished an exercise out of Camp Pendleton called Bold Quest. This is a joint international exercise at Camp Pendleton. And what you see here in these images is that these Marines were practicing how to do Suburney decontamination. Okay, what in the world is Suburney? Another acronym. Suburney is an acronym for weapons of mass destruction, chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, high explosives. So we lump in the Defense Department all those, those nasty things together in something called Suburney. And what these Marines are doing is getting in protective gear. This is called mop gear. It's incredibly hot. You can only work for limited periods of time in it before you have to change out and you're literally soaked with sweat. They change into this mop gear and they practice not only decontamination, but they're practicing triaging patients that have, again, playing the role of being exposed post a Suburney event. And how do you quickly triage and then decontaminate those patients? And this is an example of a mobile decontamination unit. It's literally a conveyor belt that you take uh, exposed patients down and uh, decontaminate them with. And then here they're de decontaminating themselves. And what are some of the preliminary results from that exercise just, uh, just a month ago? You can see this is data. That, so we took a Google Earth image and overlaid data that's coming from the polar sensors that I showed you in the previous slide. So what this God's eye view already begins to show you are the motions of the Marines as they go through this decontamination scenario. But by virtue of some of the heart rate information, you get a sense of the workload that's being experienced by those Marines while they go through that decontamination process as well. This starts to become interesting if you put yourself in the role of a commander or a unit leader where you have to get an understanding of how is my unit performing? Is there a particular individual who's on the verge of heat stroke that I need to pull out of that decontamination scenario and swap in with a fresh individual? And so that's where a lot of this interest is coming in is, how do you take this census as augment paradigm and put that into a dashboard that a decision maker can use to actually optimize their troops? And this gets back to some of the interstitial fluid uh, monitoring that I mentioned earlier. So this is using the Abbott Libre Sense. Using, it's a continuous glucose monitor with a super sapiens uh, back end. But what you can see here is pointed out by these fiducials as soon as they go to put that mop gear, that heavy protective gear on, you see an elevation in blood glucose levels indicative of the stress that they're starting to undergo as soon as they put that mop gear on. You can see it stays elevated through the exercise. The exercise ends. Glucose levels drop. Then, of course, they go up as they experience lunch, fall back down after lunch, and then start again. You see the uh, levels come back up. So we're fascinated by this fact of using uh, uh, an interstitial fluid sensor that's largely made for the diabetic market, putting that on healthy individuals, and looking at these markers of, of stress. The other thing that's interesting, and this is collaborative work, should have pointed out with Josh Hagen, who's joint between Ohio State and IHMC, is the fact that Abbott is continuing to push the chemistry that's involved in these interstitial fluid sensors. So this is glucose but they're getting ready to pull out sensors that can do lactate and can also do ketones. If you can do ketones, lactate, and glucose, you can know everything you need to know about blood metabolism and the state of the individual. So that concludes talking about those two projects and how we're using this paradigm of sense assess augment, but where's this going in the future? Why did I feel that this is so important is because we are rapidly getting into a world of human-machine teaming. And what we mean by that is that everything up to this point has really been about unidirectional flow, taking information 
through screens and dashboards and cockpit displays and continuing to push that information in one direction to the human operator. And the thing that we constantly hear from the operators that we work with is don't push any more information to me. I'm already suffering from information overload and my workload is already too high. As the advances continue to roll out with artificial intelligence, what is going to happen and is happening is that the agent on this side is starting to take the initiative for more decisions. If the agent is taking the initiative for more decisions, what you're starting to set up is a paradigm where you have bi-directional information flow. If you're having bi-directional information flow, just like a human team, this is the dy dynamic we need to understand when we think about human machine teaming. And that's clearly uh, where the, the DOD is going, and in many ways, the larger world. And how do we see that playing out? This is an example that's already underway. What you see here on the left is a uh, rendering of a program that started out as Loyal Wingman and has now morphed into a program called Skyboard. I don't know who names these programs, by the way, but that was the, probably the worst naming change ever. But what is happening in this, and this is now an advanced demonstrator, we're taking pilots that are in fifth generation aircraft, so think F-35, and what they are doing is controlling or supervising semi-autonomous agents, so think advanced drones. So no longer is the concept going to be that I'm going to be a pilot as part of a four-ship formation. I'm going to be a pilot in a four-ship formation, and I'm going to be supervising a whole variety of unmanned drones that I'm going to quarterback all around the battlefield. So by definition, you can start to see that these agents are going to start taking initiative, but unless we move forward with the appropriate sense assess augment paradigm, I would argue to you there's no way a pilot is going to be able to do that effectively in a combat operation. You're going to have to figure out ways in which you can have insight as to workload environment of that pilot and understand where to put them on the appropriate supervision loop. So enough with the DOD. Where else can you see this making an impact? I think one of the, the huge areas that's going to unfold from this is how exoskeletons will be used in particular in rehab. And so in this particular example I'm showing you, so this is Zach, one of our scientists at IHMC. You see Zach being uh, instrumented here. He's a great subject for this test because while we make exoskeletons both for uh, paraplegics and able body individuals, Zach had polio as a child, so he still has function of his legs, but it's severely impaired, and so that makes him a good subject in terms of being a pilot here. But remember, this exoskeleton is just a, a dumb electromechanical device. It has no insight into Zach. And that's part of what the science that we're doing here. The reason Zach is wearing a mask over there is we're actually measuring his oxygen consumption. So that starts to give us insight as to how hard is Zach working when he's trying to move in this exoskeleton. We have sensors placed along the appropriate muscle groups so that we can directly measure how hard are the muscles working as they try and, and work with the exoskeleton. So if you revisit this now from a sense assess augment paradigm, the ability to take feedback from these wearable sensors, in these cases, these are EMGs, electromyograms. If we can take feedback from that and interface it properly into the exoskeleton, the exoskeleton is no longer a dumb electromechanical device and now has some insight as to the operator that's using it. And if you remember in my opening comments about marching on this path towards individualization, imagine a re rehab paradigm where the exoskeleton is particularly tuned to you, to your injury, and learns how you're progressing over time through that rehabilitation sequence. So I think that's, for me, an incredibly exciting future of what this could mean for, for rehab. And then stepping back even broader and, and conclude here, Hopefully what you've seen through this paradigm is that there are numerous civilian applications of where sense assess augment can make a difference in the lives of individuals. From a health span standpoint, 
You can think about feedback on healthy aging, chronic disease management, aging at home and independence, and personalized rehabilitation, as I just mentioned. And then on the resilience side, as I've already mentioned, things like being able to uh, lessen the effect of sports injuries and concussion, and being able to lessen the impact of high-stress jobs, first responder jobs, thinking about how we can optimize musculoskeletal recovery, and then how we can actually uh, aid those that have to carry high personal protective equipment loads and decontamination. So that's, in my view, just the tip of the iceberg. I think this has a tremendous future ahead of it. And as we see these advances in AI, we're going to just continue to see how this initiative in the sense assess augment paradigm is going to become even more salient. So with that, I thank you for your attention this evening and be happy to take any questions. Oh gosh, the hands are going up like crazy. Okay. All right. I thought saw you first, sir. Here you go. Hi. Uh, just wondering what the result of the pilots losing oxygen in the F-35s was. Well, the result was, first of all, some re-engineering that was done on the OBOG system. But the other key thing was re-evaluating the actual vest ensemble that they wear when they actually get into the cockpit. It's PPE kind of stuff, but a lot of it is more directed towards the life support aspect that's within the cockpit. And a lot of it was trying to uh, do everything that, could, that is possible to ameliorate the restrictive effect that wearing a lot of that kit had on people. So it was so it was a combination, both the system that generates the oxygen, as well as the actual life support kit that each pilot has. Incredibly dense presentation. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> the my, the question that I have in particular is the individual that you were tracing in the second part of the presentation, where his glucose going up 200, etc. In that study, are you looking at some of the other evolving biomarkers of metabolic health? I don't think that individual was a healthy individual, and according to more modern sense of what health is. So are you looking at those sophistications as well when you're evaluating that process? Yeah, it is part of the, the history that we take on subjects when they come into these studies. How about, how about the biochemical markers? The biochemical markers, a lot of, I'd say, unfortunately, because of the recruiting shortfalls that are found within all of our services except the Marine Corps right now, they are changing the standards for both physical fitness, weight, and what's required to actually enter into the service. The reason I give you that background is that many of our incoming soldiers, sailors, and airmen are actually in the early stages of metabolic disease. So that, that's inevitable now in the current environment that we're in. And so I think even more so, finding ways to lessen that impact has got to be a higher priority. Yeah, I'm interested in the health span, uh, particularly the personalized rehabilitation. I'm, I'm an active 72-year-old. I work out. I ride my bike. I, I do something active every single day. But man, all of a sudden my back goes out. I twist my ankle. Is what you're talking about going to help with that? Possibly. <laughs> possibly. <laughs> the, the wiggle room of possible. I... It, when I was thinking about a nearer-term application of rehab uh, exoskeletons and, and the impact that it could have there was less on the everyday aches and pains and more for those that are truly recovering from something like ACL surgery, someone who's actually uh, recovering from something that's a little more severe for right now. But I do see a further out future where you could think about your own personal device at home that is, if you will, your, your personal exoskeleton companion that you put on, not only to help work through those things, but before you actually get to the rehab, actually play a, a key role in diagnosing what's actually wrong with you because there's a tremendous amount that can be learned from changes in your gait in terms of your overall health. So I think there'll be a key role to the, if you will, the left of the rehab, which is more on the diagnosis front. We have questions. Here. 
So on the ketone supplement that you were talking about, I think it was in the beginning mm -hmm. that they had to take that didn't taste so great. And it gave a, 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 about a window of about three hours, you were mm -hmm. saying. Um, would, would it benefit to continuously do something like that? And is that something that is available or is that just propaganda that we see sometimes on the internet? No, no, it, it is commercially available. In fact, the product that we use in this study is commercially available. Um, it's called Delta G Tactical that we use in this. Uh, again, the downsides, it, of course, you saw the taste, but it's also very expensive. And so there are a variety of newer products that are coming on the market. Uh, Ken and I actually use one where it tastes a heck, heck of a lot better, and it gives you the same serum ketone body levels that you get through Delta G Tactical, and it's also uh, significantly cheaper. I give you that background because uh, Ken and I, it's not part of a study, but we take it all the time repeatedly, uh, and mainly it helps us from a metabolic standpoint. But there, there's no reason you couldn't do a second of, uh, dose effect. There's no limit on the dosing that you can do that we know of. Do I have any other questions here on this slide? Okay. Um, James, I'll get to you next. Are you, can you grab? Can you throw? Catch? Um, I'm interested because I had my hip replaced last November, and I have not been able to walk properly the way I did before. And I want to know, is this like... 50 years from now, this is going to happen. 25 years, is it here right now? Can I go to my physical therapist and say, in, instead of using a mirror and saying, well, think about how you hold yourself when you walk and think about your alignment, uh, will there be uh, electrodes put on me that show me where my muscle is not functioning properly? Well, a few things. First of all, it's not 50 years out. It's not 25 years out. I would say it's certainly within a decade. Uh, all of that is dependent on the FDA and how, how quick they will move. There are devices on the rehabilitation market today that are based on exoskeletons. One of the more prominent ones is called Rewalk Robotics that targets the rehab community. But the thing that, in my opinion, rewalk is not attending to is this aspect that I highlighted in the talk and the fact that there's nothing smart about the rewalk exoskeleton. It's a very primitive uh, exoskeleton that has no capability to sense how your hip is operating as you go through your rehab procedure. And so it still requires a physical therapist to try and fit it and interpret how well it is functioning for you in your rehabilitation. So there are no way are there smarts to that. But again, what I was trying to, to point out in the talk, the barrier to putting smarts in a device like that is becoming lower every day. And so I certainly see a path where that could happen in the short term. Quick question. Good to see you again. And you. So it's obviously pertaining to what we discussed last time we saw each other. Clearly, the pool is shrinking for the tactical population, the first responder population, but I've heard that a lot of people say the candidates you're getting that are in shape are in great shape, CrossFit, Spartan, ex <clears throat> excuse me, et cetera. You're king for a day. How can we change it where we get a larger pool again of fit young men and women? Can I get an easier question? <laughs> Come on. What's that? I said, you got this. <laughs> Well, there's that, and I, I think what you're hitting on, there's much larger, much larger societal uh, issues at play here. And it's those larger societal issues that I think are not going to have a nice, tidy uh, tech answer to them in terms of how to address it. So I don't have a clean answer for you, James, but I do think that as a society... I think it goes back to your question, ma'am, about the onset of metabolic disease. As a society, we have to get at some of these root causes that are basically taking a huge swath of our population and making them ineligible not only for military service, but first responder service and all kinds of other 
other key, uh, key professions that we need for society to function. What's that? Yeah, well, we were talking about that earlier today, weren't we, Rich? Not that. Okay, well, all right, we're going to do one more. Is there anyone who hasn't asked a question yet who would like to ask one? I'm sorry, okay, here we go. Gary. I'm wondering about the next step, which may be beyond what you do for a living, but I'm thinking about the issues with the pilots. I have to believe that the Air Force is working to eliminate the human from the weapon system. Yeah, the terminology that they use is human optional. <laughs> uh, and the, the reason I bring it up, if you look at, so the newest Air Force platform that was unveiled a few weeks ago is the B-21 Raider. If you look carefully at the press releases around the B-21, you will see language in there about human optional in there. So that very much is in the thinking about how to take a human completely out of the cockpit. Um, I can tell you that I think it's an absolute necessity. And I say that not because we can't build an environment in which the physiology could survive. I think it's inevitable because if you look at the complexity of the air defense systems that our adversaries are using and will use, the complexity of those systems are going to re make it very difficult for a human to be in that cockpit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Whoops, sorry. Okay, we'll let one more, and then we have to say good night. Well <laughs> <laughs> to your first part of your presentation, the responses that you show were very acute and you were trying to ameliorate them with using the ketone esters. What are you, do you have any plans, or does anyone have any plans to look at our poor children who are impacted in high schools and colleges with these impact sports, and whether something like that would help them, or did you go beyond looking at that? Did, they, did the, those individuals recover? Yeah, you haven't finished the research yet, but what do you think? I. Yeah, let me just foot stop. I think the premise of your question, which is I think there's huge potential for applying this to kids in sports. As part of this research project, this project is sponsored by U.S. Special Operations Command, so it's limited to military personnel at Basic Airborne. But we're hopeful that one of the reasons we strove for such a large sample size, the reason we did that is what we wanted to do is if there is an effect, it's probably going to be small, but there's an effect there. Let's pull it out by virtue of having a large sample size and make the case compelling enough that somebody who would want to find, fund the research on the civilian side would take it seriously and take a look at it. All right. We'd like to thank you guys for being here. Thank you, Morley, for being here.